South Asian Environment Dialogue. Those of you who see this program regularly know that for the last six months or so, we have been discussing the outstanding issues of environment and climate change in this region. And the South Asian region is a very important part of the globe where a lot of things are happening in environment and climate change. And today we'll be discussing something which may not be strictly South Asian because it's a report on India's environment situation, but India being kind of an elephant in the room is very important in context of South Asia. And I have uh, none better than I can have in today. Let me introduce the panel. Uh, Sunita Naran, an environmentalist, the Globe knows, Director General of Center for Science and Environment, a, a major think tank in not only South Asia, but globally on environment, editor of Down to Earth, and I think one of the one of the biggest and strongest voice on environment and climate in the region. Uh, welcome, Sunita, for your time. It's a great, great opportunity to have you in the program. Thank you, Janto. I'm really Thanks, happy. Sunita. We, uh, we know each other for a long time, and this is a real opportunity. And I have with me uh, Visha Mohan. Visha is an editor of Environment in Times of India, one of the biggest media house, not only in India, but globally. And Visha, uh, you have been to this program earlier. It's great to have you again. Welcome, Visha, to the program. Thank you, Janto. Thank you. Uh, I have with me uh, Kalpana Sharma. Kalpana Sharma is the independent, she's an independent journalist, columnist, author on environmental and developmental issues and as well as gender. And more importantly, she co-edited the first edition of this report. I think it was called Citizen Report at that point of time, but she co-edited it. So it's, it's great to have her, have you, madam, and let know from you the kind of a background why you started it all and when I think even the Minister of Environment was not formed. So that's something really to really to know from you. And, and the last but not the least, I think the most very important person is Richard Mahap. Richard is the managing editor of Down to Art, uh, being a major, major voice and major uh, person in the environmental journalism in India. And Richard, I think, is extremely, extremely important cog in this world. And Sunita kept on talking that how Richard is important to build up this whole report. And really, I'm looking forward to Richard to know the nitty-gritties of it, that how this report has been kind of developed over the period of time. Thank you. Let me let me start. Let me start with Sunita. Sunita, this report, this State of Environment report, India 2021. What are the big big trends you feel coming out of it? So, gentle three big trends, and I think uh, for your South Asia audience, it's also very relevant to South Asia. Number one, we are seeing that there is an increased trend in terms of toxification of the environment. Now we know that as uh, our countries develop, um, as we industrialize, as we use more coal, as we burn, um, as we have more motorization, the impact of that is in terms of increased pollution. It happened in the rest of the world as well. It happened across the world. Um, if you think of the London smog incident, if you think of how polluted the, the Thames or the Hudson were, it's the same situation with our rivers today. And what the state of India's environment shows us is the trend in terms of pollution and toxification is not changing. It is becoming worse and worse. And that clearly tells us that as our countries are industrializing and as economic growth is happening, the burden on pollution and therefore the burden on health of human beings is increasing. And this report also therefore tells us that in, this is in spite of the fact that our governments, our judiciary has played a very big role in trying to control pollution but it is still not being controlled. 
And therefore, what we are pointing to is the fact that we need a different approach in the management so that we can actually find strategies unlike the rest of the world where they first polluted and then cleaned up countries like India, countries like Bangladesh, countries like Nepal, Pakistan. We cannot afford to first pollute and then clean up. So we need strategies in terms of how we can reduce, how we can grow but without pollution. And this is where uh, this report points towards whether it is moving towards cleaner fuels, whether it is moving towards ways in which we can do uh, mobility management so that we can actually move people, not cars. So essentially the report points to a crisis of pollution, of toxification, but the report also points to the fact that we cannot hope to control the if we do business as usual as it is done in other parts of the world. We need a new strategy. And the second thing, Janto, just for a brief thing, the report also looks at the second big issue for us has always been environment as development. Because for the South Asian region, we are not environment versus development. For us, it is environment and development. And therefore, for us, the issue in the report also is to look at how land, water, forests can be used better to build livelihoods of poorer communities, build resilience, and that in the age of climate change. Because what is very clear from the data that we have put in the report is that climate change is a reality. Extreme weather events are happening in our region. But what is also very clear is that these climate change will exacerbate the mismanagement that we ourselves, human beings, are doing to our land and water resources. So those are the two big trends, uh, Jayanto, if I may put it, that the report really talks about with great. a lot of detail. Absolutely great. But my point is, Sunita, is that with this major pointer that we just mentioned, now, as we mentioned that in South Asia, it's environment and development rather than environment versus development. You have been preparing this report, I think, annually. CSE has been doing it annually, down to what is doing it annually. Uh, what do you feel? Over the years, the situation has been kind of in a similar uh, equilibrium or it's going down or going up. How's the overall general assessment? I'm not, I'm not kind of picking up in similar points. And generally, what do you feel? I mean... Gentle, in South Asia is too complicated to come up with uh, an assessment like that. Anything which is right is also wrong in South Asia, okay? Anything which is white is also black in South Asia. So I cannot, I can only say to you that our assessment is very clear that overall things are not getting better. Okay. That COVID uh, last year is also going to have major impact on the health and the livelihoods of people is going to push people further into poverty. The only good news that we are finding is that we are realizing that this is not the way ahead. So if you look at the report, we have some very fascinating chapters looking at how um, India needs a car scrappage policy, for instance. Now in the past, we would have said, let the older cars move to other parts of the country. Today we are saying no, we need a car scrappage policy and we need a policy in which actually the new vehicles that are produced in India are made with materials which can be recycled. Okay? We are also saying that the government of India has actually accepted the fact that our city waste management requires a strategy which is make cities zero landfill. So for a long time, the government of India strategy was for waste management was, you know, clean up the garbage from your cities and transport it to a waste, uh, to a landfill site. Today, the, the government itself has accepted, and that's a very good and a, you know, a positive sign that the government of India has accepted. We need a zero landfill strategy. We need to process our waste. However, what our report points out is that in spite of the government saying that they want a zero landfill um, a strategy, they want to move towards uh, processing the waste, the actual indicators and the marks that are given under the ranking of cities of the government of India 
still incentivize what is called visible cleaning. I've got a clean city. Now, a clean city can mean that I've swept the roads clean, but it does not mean that I've processed the waste. So I'm not on a sustainable route. So I think what the report points out is both the problem, but I think more importantly, the SOE 2021 talks in every chapter on what is happening in terms of the implementation of the solution. And how are we moving towards it and what more should we do? And I think that's what we must now focus on, the solution, okay. the practice, uh, and the implementation. Absolutely. In fact, I, I come back to you after kind of having a quick uh, round with others, but let me kind of uh, mention the overall ASDG score. The Sustainable Development Goals score in India is 60. Is 60 as per the report out of the 100. What do you say? It's a kind of a in between uh, a moderate kind of score. So that will be reflected also on the report. So let me let me go over. This is government over, of so. India data. This is government of India data. Richard, am I right? This is government of India yeah. data. So this is government of India data. PSC's data. So, so we are basically nothing unofficial about it. <laughs> nothing unofficial about it. Yeah, it's official data. That's what government says. Yeah. We are in between. We are not very good. So government is saying that it's doing moderately. Let's let's put it in that way. Absolutely. So very quickly to the other panelists, and let me start with Kalpana Sharma, who co-edited the report. Uh, Madam, I'll be, I'll be kind of asking you later about the kind of background what you started it. But at this point of time, you have gone through this report. And what's your, what's your idea about the report? You have seen the report and, and, and anything you would like it to kind of, kind of add on in the future editions? What's your point, uh, Madam Sharma? Yeah, well, very briefly, let me say that first report, which was in 1982, um, I was not part of the process uh, from the beginning, but I did come in to edit it. And for me, it was like a schooling in environmental journalism to be working with someone like Anil Agarwal. And I think the important thing in it was that it was a citizen's report. And let me just explain why I think that is really important is because when we discussed, for instance, the focus uh, uh, of the chapter on energy, mm -hmm. I had presumed it would be, you know, hydro power, thermal power, etc. Anil was very firm that it should be cooking energy because he said that is what actually is the need of the poorest and the majority of people in this country. And also it's a gender issue because it is the women who collect the fuel. And I've always remembered that in all the years that I've been writing on environment, this is a perspective that we need. I'm very glad that in this report, for instance, there's a perspective piece which says planetary justice must put marginalized and poor at the center stage. It's by four authors. And I think the thrust of their argument is precisely the same, that, you know, we can talk um, in all kinds of technical ways about the environment, but the people who, are, who suffer at the end exactly. of it are the people who are anyway marginalized by our societies, by the economy, the way it is in all our countries, all over South Asia and I've, all over the world, I would say. And it's very good that CSC has stuck to that original brief. Uh, even though this is not a citizen's report in the way the first one was conceived, but the, the thrust of it remains very much the same. And I'm personally very glad for that. You would like, Madam, anything to add on to this report or do you think it's fine? It's, it's doing fine. It's nothing required to uh, add on. I think, you know, I think that perspective that the first report brought in, it's a very difficult way of doing it because you have to get reports from on the ground from groups, often community and activist groups who don't know how to write, who send in the information. We went through this painstaking exercise of taking official government data, but also trying to find independent exactly. sources and match them um, and rewriting what the group sent us, because obviously it was not in a form that could be put in, but I Absolutely. think it was richer. So it's really, okay. so I, you know, there's a couple of things on Habitat I can talk about it later, where I think this kind of thing can be done. Okay. 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 Great. Uh, Bishop, your take. Uh, I think we journalists, we use, we are often having a problem uh, especially in India, the quality and quantity of data. So having this kind of report, which has, I think, enormous amount of data, uh, what's your take on it? And how do you think it can be kind of, what's your suggestion about taking it further forward? Uh, we journalists love these kind of data. Whenever you find... Absolutely, data, absolutely. 
Very you can funny. do 100 stories out of this report. It's, it's <laughs> fascinating. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Please. <laughs> 100 stories you can do. Yes, sure. They just give it to you on a platter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, and when you get all the data at one place and you have to do story, uh, then you have to look for one story which you do the first day. Obviously, there are multiple stories which can be done throughout the year. But when the report is released, when you look at which first story we can do. And in yesterday's report, I must say, uh, I, find, I found the industrial cluster explanation and all the data. Uh, maybe the policymakers and readers would like to read what happened to our index process and where we stand vis-a-vis -vis 2009 performance is concerned. So when we look at the data, I, uh, it, it was sad to look at the data in the sense, uh, it, it gives a very bleak picture of uh, the air, water and land contamination situation in the country in the last 10 years. So the very idea of the CPCB to come out with this index to tell the people how we are improving, but we have not improved. Mm -hmm. So from journalistic point of, from journalist point of view, we generally look at these data and would like to tell the policy makers where we stand. So I found this data yesterday quite interesting and all over the, all over the report, there are a number of things which- In fact, exactly, I'll be coming to those. I think that, that those are great data and growth. In fact, we journalists a bit of a saddest, saddest actually. If you have a good data that government doing very well and like that, that doesn't sometimes cut ice with your editor and you have to kind of uh, have, looking forward for those do fall sometimes. But, but these are great data and these are great, great report. I want, I worked on this air pollution part of it. I think it's a very, very important data in there. As, as we said, you are working with the industrial pollution, but great, sure. anything sure, you want this kind of in future more to be added, uh, your suggestion and any, any, anything on that? Uh, Gento, I, I would like to tell uh, Richard about one thing. When I was looking for the industrial cluster data, uh, though scale is there, all the industrial clusters performance scale is there. It would have been great if the exact index number would have been there in that. Oh. Though uh, Sunita's team, Richard teams always been helpful with all the additional information. Uh, but when this kind of report will go to the people who don't know Sunita or Richard, they would like to read something from the directly from the report. So in that case, uh, it would have been better if we could have provided the exact index, though scale was there. Uh, so, and when I was looking for the story, obviously it's, uh, team members of Sunita and Richard helpful in uh, doing it. And, uh, uh, and I would say this kind of report is a mirror to the government, mirror to the policy makers, sure. what they have been doing. So these kind of reports always helpful, not only for journalists, also for policy makers. Absolutely. If you visit all the ministry, if you visit the environment ministry in, in every room, you'll find this, this report, the previous report of CSE, the down to earth report. So it's a mirror for them and what they have been doing. It reflects there. So it's wonderful Great. to have Great. this kind of question is, Vishu, question is, Vishu, whether they're keeping the mirror towards them or away from them. That's the whole question. But let, let, let you go to Richard. Richard, this report, uh, you did, it's a wonderful report. Let me congratulate you. That's a wonderful report. Now, what ALC would like to do in future with, with this report? Anything you have in your mind yourself? See, uh, it's an annual affair. The report comes, as you said, that it's a mirror. And the our primary goal is to disseminate, and if I can say that if you hold the mirror that side, we are holding that. But definitely, you know, sometimes it does have an impact at two levels. One, people to get to read and get that insight to raise the question and equip them with that knowledge. The second is that, yes, definitely even the relevant government departments, the policy makers, sometimes member of parliament, they do actually take note of this. And I can tell you in the last five to six years, we have close to around 20, 25 questions in parliament uh, based on the state of India's environment reports. And particularly as you pointed out the data. And uh, 
fortunately the data are actually originating from government only we don't have that capacity to do our own data crunching but we do analyze the data and the government data which is in public domain tells a different story when it appears exactly. in this book and okay so, uh, in fact i'll ha, please please continue no continue okay uh, i'll come back to you the details of those but let me go back to sunita uh, sunita along with whatever ishwar kalpana ji and uh, richard mentioned i have two quick comments to add one is i think this report uh, needs to convert it into something of summary of for policy makers the in line of what ipcc does because uh, i am sure that those uh, the politicians and the political executives don't have the time to go through the whole report so a summary will actually help them out and also as because it's a state wise report it can actually go to the respective states as well so what's your thought on that and also i think the rivers rivers across india are in peril real real peril so if something can be done you have a chapter on water but specifically on river anything any thoughts on that line sunita no good ideas i think all of them are very good ideas it's just that you know it it's all about capacity how much we can do um you know in terms of a summary for policy makers i've often wondered about this and richard and we in fact you know this last week richard was working with my colleague with our colleague shuparno to sort of crunch the report into press releases and put out the data in terms of data cards and you would have seen the data cards that we have done um you know it's difficult to do a summary of the soe and i think you lose the richness of it okay and i therefore really believe that the value of the soe is a little different then say down to earth or an article that is written the soe is about the package and what you get in terms of the years overall trends and big stories that you are putting together so yes we should try and do better executive summaries but i have a feeling what we need what we will do increasingly in the soe is to do more of the state of art and i think the state of art provides people a sense of where are we going and that's a big big thing i mean yesterday uh, uh jento you were very much part of the release function and you know today when i was discussing with my colleagues how what did they think of the release function vishwa you were not there yesterday but there were 60 65 people on the panel releasing the report and the combined experience of those people was like you know you could put books and books together but what was most important i think for all of us was to understand how the soes had influenced and i find when i go for, to give lectures often to say is probationers or anyone you know everybody basically the soe is a report which allows a generation to change in the way they look at things and i think Absolutely. that's where the perspective that kalpana talked about to me is most important because i am always and richard and i work together very closely on this because i am always very worried janto that environment is becoming more and more of a techno issue and people are basically looking at environment without the politics of environment and therefore if you look at the whole breed of environment what i call the middle class environmentalism which is growing in india it's it it has no politics it doesn't understand the issue of environment as exactly. kalpana does or you do or vishwa does which is about the politics of environment about the marginalization of people about the right to take decisions of the poorest about the need to look at uh, um um their their uh, you know not in their backyard i mean i am finding it so bizarre today janto that i am getting this backlash from middle class environmentalists about farmers and oh you know it's the farmers who destroy the air pollution of delhi and uh, i mean i will not name the person kalpana knows him very well a very senior journalist writes for vishwas paper a very 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 illustrious columnist 
he wrote a recent Sunday uh, column where he said, oh, look at these people, the farmers destroy air pollution in Delhi. How can you be pr uh, protecting them? And I can tell you, Janta, this is the same person who, when we, when we were taking on the campaign against diesel cars, he fought us to say diesel is not a pollutant and I have the right to drive. So when it comes to middle class, it's all okay. I have the right to drive. I have an SUV. It's a Mercedes Benz and so it's clean. But the farmer doesn't have the right to pollute. Okay? So I think it's very important that we continue till as long as we can, Janto. I think the most important thing for us in CSC in Down to Earth is to make sure that as long as we can, however strong our voice is, and it will not, I mean, you know, they, they, the, the, the new market forces are very, very strong, but our effort will be to keep this question about justice, marginalization of the poor and the politics of environment as strong as possible in Greg, spite before, of all the efforts against us. Great. Before I let you go, Sunita, a very quick response from you. Uh, Politics is a big, big player everywhere. India is even more than that. Many elections coming up in various states in India. There's a report being reflecting on each of the states. But we find our experiences, hardly this data get reflected either in the manifestos or in the campaigning process. These are being kind of an outsider. But these affect the people. Gentle. You know, I think we should stop asking that question. And if you are, if you have any experience, please look at the bitter experience we have in Delhi. As soon as air pollution became politics, mm -hmm. it has become vile. It has become vile. Okay, everybody is pointing fingers at each other. Okay, the our chief minister doesn't waste any time in saying I am clean, but it's the farmers of Punjab who are dirty. So let's be very clear. I would, I think at this time in India, I would have two messages. One, I think the politics of India have reached such a low level. I'm sorry to say this, and I think this is not just India, but across the world, that I would prefer environment to stay above the politics rather than within the politics. Okay, number one. Number two, I think environment is in politics today because environment is not about anything outside, everything that political parties care about. They care about water. They care about farmers. They care about doubling the income of farmers. They care about uh, sewage. They care about cities. They care about worker rights. I think political parties are very well aware of environment. It is always in the manifesto. And I don't look at the manifesto in the environment section because the environment section is very, very bland. Okay? I think you need to see environment as it gets integrated into the development agenda of this country, into the development manifesto of the political parties. I think the more exciting part of it for me, as somebody working in the field of environment since the 80s is, I have no doubt that environment today is center stage, that environmental issues are on the political agenda today. We may not call it environment, but they are definitely part of They are in They are very much there. Very much in And Unless I would prefer that I we cannot tell you how exciting this development is for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are all That's great. Absolutely oh, great. I think. Thanks, Sunita. I think great, great opinion. And let me go to the uh, other others who have We've all uh, options. Let me go to. I need to leave you now. I, I, I know, I know, I know. Thank you for your kind of observation and comments. I'll come back to you again and again. We will thank you, Sunita. Not Thank you, Sunita, for your time. So when we let's talk let's about go to Richard. To uh, Richard, we do this uh, I'm year, looking at the let, really this is all in year report. Uh, let's go to the deep down in the report. So we talked about the broad trends. We decided uh, I this find that to do it there are uh, we just uh, missed 10, not 16 the indicators in the Indian. Us. Part. So in some and senses, this here we, of this we find that the hunger in is that India's the score is 35, we uh, want to gender have the 42, to and, and uh, life below water is 14. Uh, Sorry, no, no sure number is there. Succeed. And overall, and India is really 60. How you see this report uh, in the developmental uh, perspective? So we just mentioned environment to be part of the development. How do you see this report in that context? 
and colleagues together in with us. One, and I, we want to make sure index. everybody gets a chance to speak. Ranking, given that, we're going to keep a very tight day, program. I, which let me give a very quick idea to everybody who's joined economy. what the program will be. Um, I'm Sunita the ranking Garayan, is actually not mid middle way only. You know, a ranking of 60 doesn't put you in the middle. And for a country like India, the middle is also not suitable because you have hardly 10 years to go to meet all these things. Now come to the point, the other part. What does it indicate? Since yesterday, many people are asking that, suppose the states that are really registering great economic growth are featuring much below in human development indices. Why is that? I think that's the question. I think this report has clearly said that. And I can tell you from the experiences that from the last 10 years, we don't find any link between the economic prosperity of the country, that's past trend, and the human development. What does it indicate? It indicates precisely one thing, that your economic prosperity is not leading to the prosperity on the basics of a certain group of people. Remember the whole existence of this country, the government and Alanges, the policy also... programs are for the only one objective, eradication of poverty. And that's also the goal number one. And we are not doing that. And poverty is not just an income poverty. Many Mr. Other... Mr. Sorry to interrupt you here. From ages, since uh, uh, Madam Indira Gandhi's time, poverty eradication is the point every political yeah, party is yeah. making. And Even here though, we find the score is 50, the hunger is 35, yeah. while the, uh, while the, I it's think the uh, economic development without uh, their participation is, is we can... Are they matching with each other, you feel? No, not, not at all. This is the point I'm thinking, your economic growth doesn't have any relation with human development first. Second is that who is a poor in India? If you look at it, it's very startling. Like last year also we reported about it. Poverty is getting chronic. And remember, this is defined as a level of poverty where you transmit your poverty to your next generation. That could be the reason why the absolute number of poor in India is not changing in the last three decades. It means if you your parents have to be are poor and you born in that family, you have chances of remaining poor forever in your life is higher and that is chronic poverty and what we are seeing that key particular geography particular group of people that all these reports are showing that are not happening so why is that if your economy has you know fivefold growth and, and richard, richard also here i think this report saying that uh, sorry to interrupt you again is the richard uh, the, this report is also saying that due to COVID, you have the new group of poor and the climate change also triggering new group of poor. So you add on to that already poverty that you are having. So yes. things are not very rosy, not very hunky-dory. Yeah, very much. If you if you just uh, just remember last time, India has stopped calculating its poor since 2011. And that's a global problem. So I'm not touching that. So we don't know who is a poor. But last year, we are supposed to have a, last to last year, the official estimate of poor in the country, the report was leaked, but was jumped. And what that leaked report showed, actually poverty. Okay, uh, let let take this point to Vishu and uh, and, and Kalpanaji, and then I'll come back to you for the other parameters, perhaps very quickly. Vishu, this is a very fascinating point that in one side we aspire to be a five trillion uh, economy. We're talking about our economic developments. In the other side, the poverty is still fifty. The score is fifty. So we're doing just being average, despite from Indira Gandhi to Narendra Modi, everybody talking about poverty eradication. Our hunger is 35, despite having so much food grains in the country. How do you see this? This is a complete mismatch, we show. This reflects how odd distribution of wealth in India is. And this is not only an Indian problem, this is a problem elsewhere in the world. Uh, it means whatever we have been doing, it's being cornered by those who are privileged, privileged in terms of those who have lands, those who have resources. Uh, I'm just giving an example, I think, uh, and it applies to everyone sitting here. For example, we all have our, all our ancestors are from the rural areas. They used to have land 
And since they used to have land, they have enough resources to sponsor our education. So now what happened, even after so many generations, our families have land, our, our families, we all got education uh, and we got job. So we are here. But the people who were landless, still landless. So it's a kind of this is the model which is there the everywhere. Uh, and this is the problem because uh, really every politician, everyone talks about eradication of poverty, but how they will eradicate the poverty? Uh, no one actually working on the ground how to do it. They are not working for the people they are supposed to do it. Uh, people from our middle class people join politics, middle class people join college, oh. universities, but the population is not as swift as it's supposed to be. And, and that's a very interesting thing is Richard was just mentioned that the data is almost stagnant over the last many years. It means that you cannot really drag back people from poverty to kind of a upper than the poverty level. So it's almost kind of in the same stature, despite this, this, this slew of government programs, the thousands of crores being kind of put into the system, this is not being acting. So is the government system acting actually to eradicate poverty? That's a big, big question coming up. Yeah, uh, basically what I think, my experience in the journalism shows that uh, whosoever, if, if the poor is uh, getting benefit, all are the default beneficiaries. Politicians do it for their own politics. The people are just the default beneficiaries. Okay, okay. It's very uh, important. I'll come back to you for the other parameters, but let's go to Kalpana ji here. Kalpana ji, you have been writing about the developmental issues you mentioned about at the initiation when uh, you, Anil, and kind of worked on this initial report. Since then, generally, not only this report, this poverty and this whole issue, how you feel that has it been really been kind of taken care of or all these are political uh, slogans we, we hear about eradication of poverty? I mean, obviously, as, as we have already discussed, obviously it has not been taken care of. And I think this idea of anything percolating from above to below, let's forget it. It doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. And we've had economists like Amartya Sen, Jean Drez, and others who've talked about how you have to build human capital for, uh, you know, for to overcome poverty. And yet all the programs that actually will do that are the ones that are often neglected. You know, the Rural Employment Guarantee Program, for instance, which people had to fight to get. Even today, it's one of those that constantly you have to keep saying to people, to the government, that this is where you have to put income into the hands of the poor, you know, and you build assets also at the same time. Uh, so it's not charity that is needed. Uh, and at the same time, even, uh, you know, this thing of skill development, who are you doing this for? So dual politics is not working. Yeah, I mean, dual I politics is not working. there's a lot of sloganeering. And, um, you know, as we're discussing the environment report, let me just say that, you know, there's no better way to understand this than the manner in which environmental issues have been handled without this perspective mm -hmm. of the poor. Because in 1982, uh, you know, there was no environment ministry, but there were slogans about the poor. I mean, we've always had this thing in India of talking about the yes. poor. In nine, two years after that, we had Bhopal, which is still considered the worst industrial accident that has ever taken place. Bhopal was illustrative of the, precisely this, of a policy of location of hazardous industries where you did not pay any heed to the fact that there was a poor colony right on the doorstep of Union Carbide. Okay. where the majority of the fatalities took place. And to me, it's appalling that today in this report on the whole issue of industrial pollution, you know, we're back to where we were. You exactly. Know? And, Absolutely. And, and not just a number that there are 88 clusters where, where are these 88 clusters? I will tell you, the majority of them will be where there are poor people living. Exactly. They're the ones Absolutely. Who yeah. You hit the nail. Let, let's, let's bring Richard here. Richard, this is fascinating. This, what Kalpanaj is just mentioning that if you look at the, if you look at the uh, kind of uh, industrial sectors, Bishop spoke at the beginning about his report on the industrial sector and Kalpanaj just mentioned that you look at the poverty, you feel that they are kind of superimposing on one itself. Uh, what do you take on that? We had a Bhupal 
but it really didn't kind of cater to the kind of reaction or response, institutional response, so to say, what we should have happened. And what are the other red lines of the report, as you find, uh, very quickly, Richard? I think the, another red line, this is being still we are in the middle of the pandemic, as it has opened also with a special pullout in mean, the section on the pandemic. You know, like all the challenges in the contemporary world, whether it's climate change or the pandemic or anything, these major global events do have class and caste bias. They impact the poor the most. So if you look at it, the fault line, as I said that, you know, the pandemic, whom did it actually impact the most? And as it pointed out, you have a new gift. You, have, you are adding new poor to the already large section of the poor. Second, like we are creating a pandemic generation, as this report shows that, quoting various uh, studies that, you know, by 2040, those who are born now will be joining the workforce. And that workforce will be actually stunted. And why is that? It is very clear that those who are poor have already suffered due to the pandemic. Then the second is that now as the overwhelming crisis, government tends to actually just react and give some relief. Okay. So okay. This, is, this is one red line. Other red lines you feel, Richard? The other, I, I tell you, means come to this. The other, I think the big one is that it overall ecological degradation that this report points. And why I'm telling you it's a red line, it's not just that pretty trees and diverse kind of things. It's because India's biodiversity definitely in Peru. The degradation is too wide. And why we should be concerned is that this biodiversity is the main economy of India's poorest communities. So these are all linked. These doors are all being linked. These exactly. doors are all linking. Yes. A forest precisely contributes 80% of a tribal person's... They depend on nature income. for survival. Yes. So, okay. I think two very important points. I'll come back to you. But let's go to Bisho. What, according to you, are the red lines or the real point of concern from this report, Bisho? Uh, look at the basic issues. Just basic issues air, water, soil contamination. If you look at uh, and look beyond industrial clusters, air pollution is there. We all are facing it. We all breathe foul air. Even politicians and policymakers breathe the same air, which poor breathe. Uh, but still, they are not working on it. So this is, this is horrible. If you look at Delhi's situation, uh, and not only the Delhi situation, the entire Indo-Gangetic plain, the same kind of topo topography and same kind of problem, uh, they're actually not working on it. Uh, one policy decision leads to another policy decision, leads to another policy decision. As Sunita earlier pointed out, uh, politicians are actually not working on it. Though there is a lot of awareness uh, due to air pollution, water pollution and all. So people, through their voices, people have started asking questions to politicians. So now they're just responding to it in a very, uh, very sketchy manner. Uh, so I think whatever these data shows, uh, it reflects that we are not at all working on addressing those issues. Okay. The basic issues of air, water, land contamination, we are not All actually, there. we are not, and I'm just giving an example. We had, uh, Sunita also pointed out about the farmers' involvement in uh, yes. air pollution and all. Uh, I can give you an example why farmers have started uh, burning uh, stubble. Uh, in fact, uh, we introduced the policy uh, under which they have started, uh, they switched over from the wheat to paddy cultivation. So it's the government which incentivized them to go for paddy. And that in turn... And thereafter, thereafter, we introduced, thereafter we, once we introduced paddy, then they will have to depend on the uh, extract water, more and more water. 
when we started depleting water, what the government did in Punjab and Haryana, they came with a law which says that before that period, you cannot show paddy. So what happens? The paddy showing period extended from mid-June, uh, from early June to mid-June towards the end of June. And when they have started doing this, the period between the next sowing and the harvest is so little that they have to depend on burning a parati. So policy, policy decision will have to take care of all this. We cannot blame the people who are actually doing it. Exactly. I think, I think very important. Uh, I'll come back to you, final kind of question round. But before that, the Kalpanaji. Kalpanaji, according to the red lines, for example, gender equality, all said and done is still only 42. The score is 42 in gender equality. What's according to you, uh, and the red lines in this report? Listen, we can make a whole program on gender equality, which is, uh, you know, it's a chronic situation in this country, frankly. Every day there are reports which show you that violence against women is, is uh, you know, it's, it's like a pandemic, frankly, you know, both within homes and outside. But let me give you two things that I, I feel very concerned about, which this report brings out. One is the whole question of habitat. You know, uh, India is urbanizing. I live in the biggest city in Mumbai. And again, everybody talks about rehousing the people who are in the urban poor settlements. So there have been programs. Now, because of global warming and because there is money coming in, the government of India has launched something called the India Cooling Action Plan, which is very laudable in order to construct houses that do not require energy to cool them. So you have that on the one hand. On the other hand, all the government programs whether it's central or state government, have continued to build these houses for the poor where they're worse off than when they were living in their huts. Because there are in Bombay, there are these seven-story structures with hardly eight feet distance, no place to breathe, and often located right next to a dump uh, with poisonous fumes coming, you know. And this is atrocious. To me, this is, this is the root of what I'm saying, that development policy is naam ke vaste for for the sake of it, it does not actually look at the needs of the poor. So if you want to rehouse the poor, surely you have to look at the livelihood and there should be a qualitative difference in the way they live. And here we are finding that people are actually much worse off than they were. So that is one, I think. And the other thing I think is uh, the whole issue of environmental regulations and how now just because of COVID and there's a downturn in the economy, there's this trust to try and revive the economy. And the solution for that is to dilute the norms that are already there. Right. Now this report shows that even the norms that were there are not being followed. If uh, between 2009 and today, we have these industrial clusters. Okay. What are we talking about? You know, so, uh, you know, I, I just feel the whole trust. And so more compromises, third, more compromises. And let me say a third thing, because a number of us are environmental journalists. I think we must look at the fact that the space in the mainstream media for the kind of reporting that did take place during the 80s and the early 90s on environmental issues, which all led to advocacy and pressure on government to try and change things, has virtually disappeared. So pollution has not disappeared, as the show, report shows. Environmental journalists are very much there, but and they're not finding the space. And many of the environmental journalists today are still those who Anil Agarwal trained in those early years to ensure okay. that. So I think, you know, the media structure in a democracy, where how do you put pressure on government to change okay. policy? Okay. So I, I, I let go to Richard for a quick uh, round again. Uh, we are talking about the negatives, but there are some positives in the report as well. Everything is not black. Uh, I can find that there's a score of 72 in the, uh, in the, in the number 16, which is plain peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, there are other good scores as well. 88, 88 is the score in clean water and sanitation. So there are a few positives as well, Richard. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, on the institution part, India definitely, you can, whether I should say in past tense or present tense, but definitely I think uh, we have good institutions, division of work, the judiciary, the executive, legislative, and many institutions have been created, whether they are effective or not. This rankings are, if you look at it, that uh, 
institution per se. The presence, existence of an institution, that's why on this parameter we always score uh, quite good, you know, that way. So we cannot compare. And the also on the water and sanitation yeah. part has a very good score, 88. Yeah. Sorry, which one? Water and sanitation. Yeah, and water and sanitation. See, remember the Prime Minister taking a personal interest in and the Swachh Bharat mission. And that was in global SAM for, you know, so world's largest number of people defecating in open in India. And um, apparently we um, attend the uh, open defecation free status a year before, in 2019. But that could be the reason why the, you know, the rank is good. The, and also energy, uh, I think 17 energy. But, but, the, but the report has pointed out one thing that we must tell you. Again, that like what Kalpana Ji is saying that the, the state of India's environment report always keep that last men and women. And particularly in case of sanitation and water, the last man has to be Gandhi is a woman. Exactly. And if you look at it, the report has very clearly said that the easiest part of building toilet has been achieved. Now what about getting water to use it? Okay. Whether okay. women will now walk 700 kilometers a week, now a year just to fetch water for the toilet, extra to the fetching the drinking water. So it's adding another 700 kilometers. Richard, uh, very quickly, we're running out of time. Is that energy, I think your score is 70. You, do you feel it's a solar to do about something about it? The kind of uh, dominance of solar and the government kind of policy on solar, going big on solar is to do something about this score of 70? Yeah, the energy basically has uh, scored this much for two, three reasons. Yes, definitely the focus on the renewable energy and um, uh, Particularly, you know, to decentralize it and this thing, it's my. That, that's the, but very the Ujjwala, quickly. The Ujjwala scheme and the cooking. Hmm. Oh, okay. That declaration itself actually checks off your ranking. Okay, that puts it up. Okay, great. Okay. Very quickly, we have just five minutes. Let's start with Vishwa first. Vishwa, how you want this report to be utilized by the government? And what do you think needs to be done to push government to kind of utilize this findings? Because these are very very, very important findings, not only on environment, but as Sunita said, everybody said, on developmental sector sources as well. What's what your thought about it? How I government should use it? Yeah, yeah. I think the report has come during the pandemic year, and when a lot of parameters have seen a drastic change. in. So just, just look at it at a base year and try to build from here. Okay, so, great, great words. Policymakers use it as a handbook look at this data and now start rebuilding India in a different way. Look at it. Because it's their data only. Because as uh, Richard and Sunita pointed out, it's government data. So it's uh, it's not really that this is something unofficial or some NGO data. It's a government data. So nothing unofficial about it. So they should look at the data very, very closely. Great words. Uh, uh, Kalpana ji, your take on that? How should government utilize this report? Well, you know, you yourself have said that this has got government data. They already have access to it. So there's nothing new in that. I think what can be the way the uh, pressure can be built on the government is for environmental journalists. And I really repeat this, that they pay heed to what is in this and investigate each of these things, whether it's industrial pollution, whether it's habitat, whether it's sanitation, you know, as Richard said, you have data about toilets, but how many people are using them? How many women are using it? This is what has to be written that about. Yeah, that, that is it. Found out. We can hold truth to power. Okay, uh, Richard, how you can hold it as a mirror to the government? What's your plan, Richard? See, the holding the mirror has already happened. The report is there. You know, the reflection is already. No, there. no, you would turn the mirror towards them. Yeah, they turn I mean, it around. The question is, I'll give you an example <laughs> of a king who refused to believe that he is aging, <laughs> and suddenly one day he looks at a, his own photograph in his bedroom and that photograph is aged. I think I can tell you to what this also told me, let's take this pandemic, post pandemic year. Post -pandemic. Because the pandemic has already, we have taken us back five years to six years in all the major development indicators. So let's get serious about it, accept it that we are not that middle level and supposed to be a, such a big country 
with a big economy and supposed to be the fastest, the largest, everything. There's no doubt about that. And I think let's spend on development. Okay. Uh, I think with that note, what just Richard mentioned that uh, with this pandemic here, also Disha mentioned and Sunita Aldia mentioned, Karpanaji mentioned, that this report very clearly shows that the poor in the country are in trouble. And if you if you look at the dots, be it the industrial sector, be it the air pollution, be it the climate impact, poor's are there who are feeling the brunt of it across India. And if we, we if we look at the state data, I could see, I saw the report very closely, in every state, many of these indicators are in trouble. So it should hold as a mirror to the government. It's a government data. It's nothing unofficial about this data. This data are government data, Sharkari data. They should use it. And as being mentioned by Visho, it should be, this year should be seen as a benchmark year. This is a, this is a kind of a life-changing year. And government should try to build up on that. They're talking about this poverty eradication for ages without understanding that without taking care of environment, politics, politics and poverty cannot be eradicated at all. So they to understand that poverty has that linkage with the environment. So with all this, another day, another time. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to South Asian Environment Dialogue. Those of you who see this program,